This is the Homestead Journey Podcast, the podcast dedicated to the pursuit of self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. This is episode number 51 of the Homestead Journey Podcast. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in and joining us here on the Homestead Journey. My name is Brian Wells. I am coming to you from 3B Farm and Homestead here in beautiful upstate New York. It is fall here in upstate New York. As I record this, it's the beginning of October of 2020. And folks, it just seems like overnight, the leaves here in upstate New York have turned. And we are experiencing, it really is surprising to me, but we are experiencing right now some of the prettiest leaves I can remember in the last several years. And usually if we have a very dry summer, we'll get more of the dull browns. But this year, for whatever reason, we are getting those nice, bright fall colors. And it's just really uh, beautiful. It's that time of year when you enjoy a nice mug of hot apple cider, mulled cider, or maybe hot chocolate, or maybe some libation of your preference. As you sit around a campfire in your sweatshirt or your fleece, it's just that time of year, and I'm just really enjoying it. I really enjoy the changes of season that we have here in upstate New York, and as Many people are fleeing upstate New York, are fleeing New York in general, heading to warmer pastures, greener grass, <laughs> heading south. I have just never had that desire, not to say that I never will leave upstate New York, but if I were to ever leave upstate New York, I would look at going to a place like New Hampshire or Maine, some place that has the changes of season that we enjoy here in upstate New York. I really enjoy it. And so I'm just really enjoying fall right now. As I said a couple of weeks ago, I'm done. <laughs> done with the garden. And so that may be another reason why I'm really enjoying this time of the year. It just feels like the pressure is off. Now, that's not to say that yesterday and today in particular have not been very busy. They have been. And I will bring you up to speed here in a moment. But just things are starting to chill out a little bit here on the homestead. And so I am really enjoying that. Having said all of that, let's jump into this week's homestead happenings. And I will bring you up to speed with what we've been doing here on 3B Farm and Homestead. Now, if you follow us on Instagram and Facebook, uh, and if you don't, why not? <laughs> the links are in the show notes, so definitely if you are a part of those platforms, you definitely check us out and uh, see what we have going on. I try to post there fairly frequently to keep people up to date with things that we're doing here on the homestead. But if you follow us on Facebook and Instagram, you will see that this week we had two very big projects uh, that we undertook. The first one was some very much needed maintenance on our driveway. It's something really that I probably should have done back. In fact, not probably. I'll throw that right out of the window. I should have done back in the spring, but I was just so busy trying to get the garden in that the driveway just fell way down on my list of priorities. And so this week I had some loads of stone brought in and uh, then I borrowed this homemade grater that my neighbor has. It's a piece of grating that he welded some metal to so that it would connect to a three-point hitch on a tractor and he was gracious enough to let me use that. And so I leveled everything out in the driveway and it looks really nice. And so hopefully it will stay that way throughout the winter and into the spring and then probably I'll have to do it all over again. That's just the joys of having a gravel driveway and the way my ground slopes especially the field that's right next door to us we don't own it but there's a high spot in that field and so the water just runs right down off that high spot 
and right across my driveway and so it washes out my driveway quite frequently especially in the spring when we have the heavy spring rains and so it's just a battle that I will always fight here it is what it is it's just the joys of having a gravel driveway and at some point I'd like to buy a box blade for my tractor maybe a York rake but Hey, if your neighbor's got something that he's willing to let you use for free, why go spend a lot of money on something? I'm all about that. Frugal, right? The other big thing that we did is uh, this weekend was our weekend where we send our lane flock over the rainbow. <laughs> now, if you follow this podcast for any length of time, you will you may recall that our process here, our method of raising layers here on 3B Farm and Homestead is that we will get pullets in the spring and then when they start laying in the fall, I dress off the previous year's hens, we pressure can them, we cook the backs and the necks down and make broth out of them and then we have Homestead fast food right in the pantry and it's just, it's so delicious too folks, it is just absolutely mind-blowingly delicious. Whew. But anyhow, so yesterday I uh, spent all day dressing off chickens. We had, uh, I think it was 40 chickens total between the, the layers that we had and the extra cockerels that we had that we shouldn't have had, but it just is what it is. I think a lot of people this year when they ordered sexed birds, got a lot more roosters than they're used to getting. Usually I might get maybe one or two extra roosters that I wasn't planning on. They might mess it up a little bit. But generally speaking, when I've ordered pullets in the past, I've ordered pullets, I've gotten pullets. This year I ended up with seven extra cockerels. A friend of mine actually out of, I think, 12 birds, that were supposed to be all pullets, he got nine cockerels. And I've heard that from a number of people where this year I think it was the sheer volume of birds. They probably didn't have people that were well experienced doing the sexing. And so it is what it is. So we did up a total of 40 birds yesterday and my dad came down and helped me for a few hours in the morning. But other than that, it was me, myself and I out there processing. And I'll tell you the reason why I do it that way is because my son in particular, my wife a little bit, but my son in particular has developed an emotional attachment to these birds. He takes care of them by and large throughout the year. And while he recognizes that they are food, eventually they're going to be food, it still is very difficult for him. It's a difficult day for him. Not to say that it's an easy day for me, but it's a very difficult day for him. And so I have tried to be sensitive to that fact. There perhaps are some people who would say, get out there, boy, and this is just a part of life. But I just have chosen not to, to go that route. And when this day rolls around, it's usually me, myself, and I. My dad helped a little bit. A few years, I've had some friends come and help me, but usually I just tackle this project by myself. Now, my wife has told me that perhaps next year she's going to come out and join me. But I don't ever see my son, now he's 16 and in a few years he won't be around anyhow on this day, but I don't ever see him taking part in it, at least not with the flock that he has raised. And I can totally appreciate that. Again, I try to be sensitive to that. This year I did break down and let him keep a hen from last year. There's this one buff Orpington that follows him around. He calls her Sweet Pea. She follows him around like a little dog there's a friend of ours that has chickens and she just raises them to a ripe old age. And when they pass, she digs a hole and buries them. <laughs> and so he said, uh, dad, do you think that Miss Sally might like sweet pea? And I said to him, I said, bud, do you want to keep sweet pea? He said, yeah, dad, I I'd like for Miss Sally to keep her. If she said, no, do you want to keep sweet pea? He said, yeah. All right. You can keep sweet pea. And so, yeah, we have a, hen that will probably never make it to the stew pot. And I'm good with that. We just can't keep everyone, right? <laughs> but anyhow, so yesterday I went ahead and butchered all of them and I discovered what the issue is with my plucker. 
the tensioning rod is not, it's not providing enough tension. So I've got to address that. Otherwise, the, it, it just slips a little bit. It'll get bound up. So I've got to address that before next spring. I just got to remember that I need to do that. I need to write myself a note. Because <laughs> what will happen, invariably, it'll be the night before we go to process next year. I'm like, oh, yeah, by the way, I was supposed to do something on this. And what was it? <laughs> I probably should fix it now, but I'm not going to. I'll just be honest with you. Not going to. So in the spring, I just got to remember that I, got, I need to apply some more tension. And I think things will work a lot better. I started about 6.30 in the morning with the processing. I was done and had things cleaned up, not put away, but cleaned up by about 3 o'clock. And then I came in and started cutting chicken up. And we had our first runs of the canner done by, I think, about 9 o'clock last night. And that was 21 quarts of canned chicken. Now, we can it bone in. And uh, basically what you do is you cut up the birds into parts and you shove them in a quart jar as much as will fit in a quart jar and you put a lid on it and you pressure can it for 75 minutes. And that's it. Uh, I don't add water. I just let it generate its own juices and it is some of the best tasting chicken you will ever eat. It is so good. And the, it just falls right off the bone. So it really makes it so super easy. It's great for stews and soups. And if you want to do chicken quesadillas or chicken salad sandwiches, it's just so very versatile. And it just absolutely tastes great. And then I take the backs and the necks, throw them in the roasting pan, as you probably have seen on Instagram and Facebook. And I cook those down and we can that broth up. And so today, I record these podcasts on Sunday, this afternoon, was a continuation of that process where we canned up uh, the remaining of the chicken. So I had another full canner run. We have a All-American 921 and All-American 930. So between the two of them, I can fit 21 quarts at a whack. And so we did that. And now I have three more in with some broth and doing a, a run of broth as well. And then we'll finish that all up tomorrow. I've got another load of backs and necks in the in the roaster and so tomorrow we will finish up with the broth and let me tell you something folks that broth oh my goodness so rich so amazing mm. oh i'm just getting hungry thinking about it and i've been smelling chicken for the last two days and yet i'm still getting hungry because that stuff tastes so great in fact the first year i did it i had so much broth I had two big, huge stock pots of broth, and it was about three o'clock in the morning when I was turning off the canner, having canned up the first stock pot of broth, and I had been going since six o'clock in the morning that day, so here it was almost full 24 hours in, I was just beat, and I, I didn't have a place to put the broth, a place to cool it and store it, and I just said, enough is enough, and I took it, and I dumped it out in the woods, and I kicked myself so hard over that stupid decision. Now, thankfully, we have more canners and we can do a lot more and, and so on and so forth. I don't anticipate that ever being a problem. And I also have uh, bigger coolers in which I could put the stock pot of broth, which I didn't have back then. So we've learned a lot. But let me tell you something, folks, that broth, it is absolutely amazing. You make it, it'll, it will blow your mind. It's a life changing experience. Anyhow, that's what we've been doing here on 3B Farm and Homestead. We'll be finishing up the broth run tomorrow and maybe into Tuesday. We'll see. But man, it just feels good to have all of that in the pantry. And uh, we will be enjoying that throughout the winter months. All right, let's jump on over to this week's Charting the Course. <music> So last week, we talked about pig housing as the result of a question that I received from a listener via our Facebook page. A listener by the name of Daniel reached out to me and asked me about pig housing and pig fencing. And so this week, we are going to answer question number two or the second part of Daniel's question with regards to pig fencing. Now, the old adage is that good fences make good neighbors. And with the exception of goats, I don't think there's an animal where that phrase rings truer than with pigs. 
because it's not going to take long to get your wife's flower bed or your neighbor's prize-winning heirloom tomato garden destroyed by pigs if they get out of where they're supposed to be. <laughs> it, trust me, folks, they can wreak havoc very quickly. But beyond just that, beyond just wanting to be good neighbors, ensuring that your pigs stay where they're supposed to be is very important. It's important because in some places, there are actually civil penalties for escaped pigs. And in part, that's because some areas struggle so much with feral pigs that having more pigs out there just is going to increase the possibility of having more feral pigs. But there's also biosecurity concerns. So if your pigs get out and go to your neighbor's a house who maybe has pigs as well, whatever your neighbor's pigs have, your pigs now have. So you've got biosecurity concerns, safety concerns. If you have small kids around on your in your homestead, your grandkids, your kids, certainly you don't want a 700 or 800 pound pig running over them or attacking them, being aggressive towards them. But you also don't want your pigs getting into a bag of garbage that has rat poison in it, which is something that we had happen to us back in the spring. You may recall, I got a phone call from a friend of ours. We were out skiing and they had stopped by to drop something off here on the homestead and they said, hey, you've got a pig out. And so we jumped in the car and came home as quickly as possible. And thankfully, I was able to get to her before she discovered the rat poison in the bottom of the garbage bag. My wife had tied up the bag of garbage and I had not yet brought the garbage bin. We have weekly garbage pickup. I hadn't brought the garbage bin back from the edge of the drive. We have a long driveway. Hadn't brought it back and my wife had just set the garbage underneath the carport and the pig got into it. That could have been a very bad thing. Thankfully, like I said, I got there before she discovered that. But certainly there are safety concerns with regards to making sure that you have your pigs where they're supposed to be. And then if you are breeding for pedigree, certainly there's those kinds of concerns with regards to ensuring that you have good fences. So before we get into the type of fences that you might want to consider on your homestead, there are some things that you're going to want to consider before you build fencing because you want to make sure that you have the right tool for the job. You're using the right type of fencing for your particular situation. So the first thing you're going to need to consider is the size of the pig. And it's not just the size of the pig from the standpoint of the breed, but are you going to be keeping piglets in this area? Or are you going to be keeping adults in this area? But they have different fencing requirements because a piglet can certainly get through a hole that's much, you know, a smaller hole than what an adult sized pig could get through. So you might be able to use cattle panels, for example, for adult pigs, but cattle panels probably are not going to work well for piglets because the hole size is much bigger. You also need to take into consideration the size of the area that you're going to be fencing because fencing can get very expensive very quickly. And so if you're going to be fencing, let's say a 32 by 32 area, then cattle panels or hog panels might make sense. But if you're going to be fencing in an area that's an acre in size, hog panels would get very expensive very quickly. The next thing you need to think about is is electricity available in the area where you're going to put your fence? If not, can you run electricity there? If not, is there a sunny enough area there where you could set up a solar charger? Otherwise, electricity or electric fencing isn't going to be part of your solution. If you can't get electric there, if it's not an area where you can set up a good solar charger, then you're going to have to rely on physical barriers. Another thing you're going to need to think about is your method of keeping pigs. What is your overall strategy of keeping pigs? Are you going to be rotating them on pasture? Are you going to be keeping them in semi-permanent paddocks? Are you going to be keeping them in a woodlot? 
all of those scenarios are all great scenarios for keeping pigs. There's nothing wrong with any of them, but each one of them is going to have slightly different fencing requirements. Now this one is very important and this is one that it took me a long time to learn this lesson. <laughs> but you want to make sure if you're keeping a boar that you keep your boar where your boar is supposed to be and you keep your girls where your girls are supposed to be because if your boy gets in with your girls, well you're going to learn a lot about bunny math but as it applies to pigs. <laughs> and then obviously if your girl gets in with your boar, that's a little less problematic, but still you might end up with a litter at the wrong time of the year. And I've had both of those things happen where my boar got in with my girls and I've had my girls get in with my boars and then I've had winter litters and it's just not great. So make sure that you have a great strategy and you think about how you're going to keep your boar separated if you're keeping a boar. The other thing that you're going to need to take into consideration, a lot of times we think about keeping your pigs in. And that's certainly very important. But you also may need to think about keeping feral pigs out. I'm very lucky that I live in an area where we don't have a problem with feral pigs. But there are a lot of places in the South and Texas where feral pigs are a big problem. And so you may need to think about how you're going to keep those feral pigs out of your pig paddocks, making sure that you're, you don't have a wild boar coming in and fighting and killing your boar or a wild boar coming in and impregnating your sows. So you need to think about whether or not you have feral pigs in your area and then what your fencing strategy is going to be to keep them out. So having said that, what are your options with regards to fencing? Really, there's two major, I guess I would call them categories of fencing that you can use to hold pigs. And that would be physical barriers and then electric fencing. Or you can use a combination of the two, which is what we use here on 3B Farm and Homestead. Now, for a physical barrier, you can use something as simple as pallets. I visited uh, one individual. He actually, I bought some water barrels from him for uh, pig waterers. And we're going to talk about pig watering next week. But I, I bought some pig waterers from him. And he simply had taken pallets. Uh, he had taken T-posts and driven them around an area and then just put pallets over those T-posts and that's what he was using to keep his pigs and it seemed to be working very well. Hog panels or I guess they're technically called feedlot panels. There's a number of different configurations and it just depends on the animal as far as what the size is of the holes in these panels but they're generally speaking about 16 feet long and the hog panels, I think, are 34 inches high. I think the cow panels are 54 inches high, I think, maybe something like that. There are some that are designed for goats and so forth. Really, the big difference between the hog panels and the cattle panels is that the hog panels on the bottom have a really narrow spacing. And that's designed to keep piglets in containment where the cattle panels, the piglets would be able to get right through. But those are a great option for being able to set up very quick areas, maybe for quarantine. Um, we use them for that. If you want to set up a semi-permitted area, but then you want to be able to collapse it and move it somewhere else, they work very well. But they do cost about $20 to $25 a piece. So that can add up very quickly if you were to fence in a large area with those. But they do definitely, they're, they're definitely very valuable, in my opinion, for being able to set up temporary containment areas and being able to segregate. Maybe you need to segregate two sows. They're just really invaluable, in my opinion. But hog panels are certainly something that you're going to want to consider. Now, another physical barrier is field fencing. Field fencing comes in rolls. And I actually use 
field fencing as a physical barrier with a hot wire on the inside of it. So that kind of keeps the pigs where they're supposed to be because the field fencing, if you stretch it tight, it would contain a pig in and of itself. But how I have it run, it's not stretched tight. There's a lot of reasons why that's the case. But it does provide a bit of a physical barrier, but then that hot wire on the inside of it, the electric hot wire that I run that's about six to eight inches up off of the ground, that keeps them back off of that physical barrier. So field fence is definitely another option. If it's stretched tight, I believe it would work well for pigs. The other thing you might want to consider is portable fencing. If you are keeping your pigs on pasture and you're moving them from moving them around, then having a portable electric fence would certainly be a great option. Premier One offers a pig fencing that's, I don't know, maybe 34 inches high. I haven't used it personally, but I've heard good things about it. You just need to make sure that the pigs are trained to it. And that's really the case with any kind of electric fence. You want to make sure that the pigs get trained to understand if they hit it, it's going to zap them and then they will respect it and it'll keep them away. And we'll talk a little bit more about that here in a little bit. And then another option that I see very often used is simply a two or three strand configuration where people will run two or three strands of electric fencing. Maybe they'll have one strand at maybe eight inches, another strand at 12 or 16 inches, another strand at 24. They run that around the perimeter. And again, they train their pigs to the fencing and the pigs learn not to hit up against it and it contains them. The thing is with pigs, what I have found is one of two things. Pigs will remember where an electric fence has been and they will respect that area. And sometimes it's very difficult to get a pig to cross an area where they know an electric fence has been, even when the electric fence hasn't been there for a while. But I've also found that pigs are very smart and pigs can figure out how to push something up against a hot wire and get it to ground out. And once they realize that wire is no longer live, then they will go wherever they darn please. <laughs> And so for me, I just do not trust electric fencing in and of itself. I don't. There are a lot of people that do, that use that. Jack Polner over at the Mindful Homestead does two, I think it's two strand, might be three strand electric fence with his pigs in the woodlot and, uh, and has good success with it. I just don't trust it. And so I opt for having put up large paddocks using field fencing. Now it cost me, I won't say a boatload of money, but it wasn't cheap to do that, to set up field fencing. And then I run the hot wire on the inside of that in some areas. In other areas, we have cattle panels and there is no hot wire on the inside of it. It is just cattle panels, very well secured. And then what that does is it allows me to do different configurations depending on whether or not I'm keeping a lot of animals in there or I just need to segregate a sow and her piglets or I need to segregate a couple of different pigs or groups of pigs. And that really wasn't something that was well planned out on my part. It was just dumb luck. But I have my paddock set up so that I can have multiple configurations depending on what my needs are. And so again, if I need to segregate one sow, I can. If I need to segregate the piglets, I can do that. And I do that mainly with the um, hog panels. Right now I have, as you saw in last week's video, where I have the sow and the piglets that came back from that other farm, I have them in an area uh, where it's four pieces of hog panel and I have eight T-posts that hold those four pieces of hog panel up. So it's a big, huge square. So it's going to be 16 by 16. And that is the area for her and her five piglets. Works out very well. And if I need to, I could collapse that and move that. And it would not take me all that long to do. It would take me longer to move the doghouse <laughs> than it would to move the fencing. Now, in my area, 
as I've shared with you before, we're on rocket shale and it sucks and it's tough to drive Tipo. So I don't, I try not to move stuff around too much, but it's certainly very easily done with those hog panels. And, uh, and so that's what we use those for. If you have any questions with regards to pig fencing, maybe something that I wasn't clear about, definitely reach out to me, but we have had really good luck with hog panels and using field fencing with a single strand of electric on the inside. One other thing that I will leave you with, and that is that I think it's very important to train your pigs to follow buckets. It's not a matter of if you have a pig that gets out, it's a matter of when the pig gets out. The easiest way to get them to go back to where they need to be is simply to train them to follow buckets. And the way you do that is simply show up with buckets with feed in it. And they come to recognize that a bucket has food. And so sometimes you can just rattle a bucket and not have anything in it. And they're going to follow it because they equate buckets with food. I know it's much easier just to take a bag of feed down and dump it into the feeder if you're free feeding pigs. I get that's much easier. But if you're doing that, then take your scraps down in a bucket or at least throw some of the feed in a bucket so that they begin to associate buckets have good things. Because then when it comes time to load them onto a trailer, they will follow a bucket right up into a trailer. They will follow the bucket. If you need to move them from paddock A to paddock B, they will follow the bucket. Is fencing is important? Yes. Making sure that you've got good fences? Yes, definitely number one. But close second to that is training those pigs to follow buckets because when they get out, <laughs> you'll be able to get them back in, having them follow you around with a bucket. Okay, everyone, that's it for this episode. If you have any questions or comments, you can reach out to me, Brian at the homesteadjourney.net is my email address. Or as Daniel did, you can reach out to me on Facebook or via Instagram. You can also reach out to me via our YouTube channel. All of the links to our social media accounts are in the show notes. If you'd like to support the show, you can do so in a number of different ways. First of all, simply leave us a review on iTunes or whatever your favorite method is of consuming podcasts. Give us a thumbs up, a like, whatever it is they require or allow, and then share the show with other people. I would really appreciate it if you did that. The other thing you can do is on our website, thehomesteadjourney.net slash shop, you will find a list of items that we use here on 3B Farm and Homestead. And if any of those things are of interest to you, if you click on that link and buy it, a portion of that comes back to us and helps support the show. And if you, you were going to buy it anyhow, then why not help a brother out? No, but I really would appreciate it. And that is a great way for you to be able to support the Homestead journey. As always, the music on this episode was provided by the folks over at Audionautics.com, so a big shout out to them. And until next time, everybody, keep up the good work.